Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to my YouTube channel. This is uh, Steve uh, coming back with a Commodore 64 game project code example for video four. And in this series, um, as from the uh, previous video that I just released here, you're going to be learning about the animation of sprites on the screen. I'll introduce some segments of that and show you how that works. And you're also going to be learning how the collision detection works between objects. I'll kind of explain that as I'm moving a sprite around had to stop and go into code and stuff like that to kind of go back and forth. Um, be sure to watch the other video out there already because you'll be able to learn some tips from that. So thanks for watching. I appreciate your subscriptions as always and turn on those notification bells. And yeah, let's get this started. Okay, everybody, we are now starting a Commodore 64 game project for video four. Um, you will probably notice already that one of the things I've changed in here is I've um, implemented a new Charpad map to kind of uh, demonstrate the video series here going forward. And I'll try to come up with more levels and stuff like that as we continue forward, just to kind of, you know, make it more interesting, hopefully. So here's the sprite, and I'll just move down here a little bit. Some of the things I kind of created. And you can see the sprite's kind of bumped up against here, so he's not able to go down. So that's controlling that check down move subroutine. As I move down here, check moves uh, down is coming into motion right there. And of course, we pass through the ladder, so there's no detection going on there, even though there's a ladder. I'm not checking for the ladder, so he's able to freely move there. And if we go to the wall here, that's checking the sprite move to the right. Check move right, right there. So check move right and check move left is in that direction there. So you'll see that the sprite can freely move around here until he bumps into something like there's a check move up, so he can't go through the wall there. And, you know, check move left and, of course, check move right. As I continue to move down the screen here, even as he scrolls, he stops when he hits an object. So, kind of show you a little bit more of the little map I was working on. I didn't really do a whole lot with this one. I was going to try to create a city map, but it looks like it came out too big here. But... Just for the purposes, I wanted to kind of um, use this as a demonstration just to show you how the collisions work and all that. And when he gets to an area, of course, he's always going to stop at that area like that. So come across that here. And in later sessions, you'll be able to go up the ladder like that. And then if he's not on a ladder, he'll fall off. We'll have gravity and stuff like that. But just for now, this one, he's able to move around freely anywhere on the screen. So there's no gravity or anything going on here. But just to show you some of the map that's going on with the actual level in progress, so to speak. And I think that's the end. That's the bottom of the screen right there, actually. More of the map over here. Looks like that's the edge right there. Okay, and even as I move over here, because we have those attributes set by the char pad data, it's not able to, he's not able to pass through because it's reading those values. If you saw a video, I think it was video three where I talked about the char pad attributes, the material data right there, it's reading that material data so he's not able to pass through a wall. When there's no char pad attributes though, he can freely move around. Okay, let's get into some of the code here, so I can try to hopefully break this down and connect the dots for you here. Okay, guys, I'm back in the coding example here, and I'm in the main ASM file for Project 4 here. And as we scroll down here, you'll see all the other code is still the same here. But we get down to the bottom here, and right here. This is where we implemented the new sprite data to be able to read each individual sprites from sprite 1 to sprite 6 and so on, all the way up to sprite 62. Um, many of these are not being used yet in the project, but we're using the left right animation, um, the punch and all that will come later. Um, some of the real focuses we have here now, though, is we, um, and let me switch over here to sprite routines. We actually introduced the uh, sprite routines into the project here 
so we can keep track of the sprite position data as I talked about in the original video here. So this is keeping track of the sprite as he's moving to the left. And as the sprite's moving to the left here, we're keeping track of the individual bits that are going on so we can track when a sprite has passed over. So essentially he's over here in the corner, let's say, and he reaches that um, zero position on the high end. Basically that a high bit, he's going to pass over into the lower low byte column, essentially. And that's going to clear that carry flag so that he can continue across the screen here. Same thing happens here with the right. He's going to the right. He reaches that low, that 255th position, which is, you know, that, that maximum that he can reach on the low. How can I say this? On the, um, the low byte. So the low byte is going to essentially set the carry flag and it's going to allow him to pass over. And that's what that bit that bit is doing right here, right here, bit table right there, that's setting a high bit so that we can go ahead and move the data forward. So it's basically checking this character data that's set up across the screen and checking to see when those bits are need to be set in specific positions. And as you reach its 255th position, of course, the sprite can pass and continue to move to the right. And it basically resets the what's called the most significant bit so that he can continue on across the screen. So we get full access to the whole screen backward and forward. And the move up is keeping track of the sprite Y position. And the move down is keeping track of the, the move down position for the sprite Y position. So essentially a lot of these are very similar. We saw this one in the last, last project. Here's the animate sprite as I spoke about in the other video. This is uh, setting up the player and animation states and the timing of the animations they're set. And the sprite animation is keeping track of each individual frame of the sprite. So as a sprite is shown on the screen, that's one frame. And as animation frame changes, you'll see another frame and so on. And that keeps track of those different states here. And you can see this is the actual sprite data I'm referring to here. So let me kind of move these in. I know the sprite screens are going to be smaller now. But this is the sprite animation frames, and this is a sprite animation frame here. These are the frames I'm referring to. This is frame one, frame two, frame three, and so on. So it's changing those different positions. Remember, we have the stack sprites. We have the head sprite, and we have the, the body sprite for the legs. So it's keeping track of both of those positions there, from the low and the high bytes. And it's passing this data into zero page pointers that will be used later in this uh, project, or even in this subroutine that we're in already. We're setting up the timers of the animation right here. So make sure you see where I'm at there, Sprite Anim Timer. And this is um, going to keep track of those um, MSV and the timer, and it basically does the resets. And it's just basically a way of slowing down the animation frames so you can actually see them. And then here's that zero page pointer we talked about earlier. Remember, if we um, went back up the screen here, we stored the frames right here at the zero page pointer, and here we're loading them. And this is where we're going to basically be able to take that data and set it to the screen now that we have the animation frames. So it keeps track of those in the table to determine which sprite to show on the screen. And these are type loops. So if it's looping, the animation is going to loop as that ping pong, which is that back and forth kind of motion. You see, like when the legs are kind of moving back and forth there. So there's the sprite animation frames. Cool. These are the different animation states. That keeps track of those sprite animations. So this is where that sprite animation table back here. So it's keeping track of this zero page pointer right there to show those different sprite animation frames. And everything else is kind of the same here. After we set the sprite, we um, go here and we load the sprite base to basically put those sprites to the screen. And this initialized sprite anim, this is used actually in our player routines to call the initial sprite animation. And this actually triggers it that we've set an animation for that specific sprite, which is what the X represents. And again, we're, we're going to load in zero page values. If you see the zero page pointer one here, we'll switch over here to player routines so I can show you what's going on here. I'm going to skip ahead here just for a minute to show you. So let's go to like the idle state. You see this one is the player animation idle, right? It's being loaded into the zero page pointer one and zero page pointer one plus one, which is the low and the high bits of these um, 
the low and high bytes of the, the zero page pointers. So it keeps track of the animation frame, which is what these are keeping track of. So this would be, this could be 13, for example, and then 14 could be loaded into here. And then we skip back over here, you'll see that now this is storing in those animation frames and it's basically transferring it to our sprite animation, which is what we were using up there in the other routine there. So hopefully that makes more sense. Uh, zero page pointer is a way of capturing the data on the screen mostly and just saving it. If you wanna, if you, whether you wanna read screen addresses or you wanna read sprite animation frames or whatever, this is exactly what's going on here. So these are the animation frames and I showed this in the initial video of this, which is just the regular video. When I first introduced the Commerce Super Game Project, I showed that first video with the code and the PowerPoint slides. This one is grabbing the animation idle. So if you look here, it's four and two. So if I switch back here, let's go back to four for a minute. And let me switch this back to four so you can see what's going on here again. So what I wanted to show you here is if you look here at the sprite animation, I'll switch back here again to the CBMPRG studio. And if you want to make a record of this, this is a byte four and two, right? So four and two is our idle animation. That's that, that ping pong going back and forth type ping pong, basically four and two, four and two, and so on. So if we go back to our sprite editor, you'll see I have four set here already. Remember it's reading the legs and the top and the head but it's reading two. So if we go back here to two, it's reading this one, and then it's reading this one. So those all the way goes from one to four. And that's exactly what that's doing. It's reading that data in. Now, remember we saved this in the animation frame, I'm sorry, in anim player idle area. And this anim player idle is right here being stored into our player state idle to read the idle animation. And remember what I mentioned, it's being saved into zero page pointers here so that we can use it in our sprite route. So we're passing it in here, but we're going to initialize the sprite animation. So right after the zero page pointer, it goes to a knit sprite anim first. And if we go to a knit sprite anim, which I believe is down here, yep, here it grabs that zero page pointer. So we know that that's going to be frame two and four, right? And it's saving this in the sprite animation. So the sprite animation is gonna keep track of these individual current sprite data right here. So our four and our two, right? Our two and our four, as we saw back earlier when we first recorded the anim, um, oh, it's down here at the bottom again. It's the um, anim player idle. And the anim player idle is being set into that initialized sprite animation here. So it's saving that, it's just loading those uh, individual frames into here and saves those into sprite animation, right? And then from here, we're loading, um, we're resetting, well actually we're, we're reading from the values now. So we're basically reading directly from that memory location where the zero page pointer was storing the data. And we're writing this into a sprite anim timer to keep track of the timing for this sprite as well. So there's a couple of things going on here. And then here's where we set the initial sprite animation on the screen. So that just, you see how it's grabbing the frames there? And then from there, it's just setting them on the screen. So you could change these, for example, I think eight and 10 might do it. So let's switch that to eight and 10 and see if we can get that animation state to change. It may do something else weird, but we'll go ahead and we'll change that there. And you didn't see me on the sprite editor as I was showing it, but essentially here, I was um, going through the individual sprites here, seven, and this is the eight, so it's always gonna read from that lower one. And we're gonna change it to this sprite animation right there, you see right there. So there's our sprite animation. This is gonna, again, what we're doing is our goal is to change this um, animation here. So I'm gonna rerun the project, so I'm just gonna switch back over here to CVMPRG Studio here. Um, so I'm going to go up here to main, and in here, there's um, a button here you can click to run the project right there. And it's going to force this one back up. Wait for the sprite to load. Yeah, so we switched over to our new idle just by switching those two. I do believe that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, because the other one had um, the head facing down. This one's kind of facing up. And we could do any of these uh, frames that we want to put into this whole project here. So we got this one moving, 
but we could also go back into any of these and then change and add any of these into it. You could do this from the right routines, the left routines. I just want to show you so when you go to build your own sprites, you know how to add in your own specific animations here. Okay. But we could really just go back and use any of the other ones. We could switch it to the right, left animation, whatever states we wanted. I could even change the left movement for the punching or whatever I wanted at that point. Just by doing it here. Let's put it back to the initial one. And we could change the walk up, walk up animation if we wanted to, for example. Any of these can be done in the actual initial project there. So hopefully that makes sense on the sprite animation side there for you. Um, I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, clarify that for you guys so that you can understand. That's what we're doing. We're changing the sprite animation frames as we're moving through things here. And we're just adding these into these um, variables. That's reading this byte data directly into our subroutines. Timing can be changed too, but I won't mess with that right now because it kind of does messes up the, the timing of the sprite and it doesn't look very good. So but all that could probably be learned later. But on that side, we could switch over here back to our CBMP or to studio, switch to our collision detection here. And these are the ones I talked about in the other video, the check move left and all that. Initially, we wouldn't need to really change anything in here, but just to demonstrate here how this is working. If we go to player routines here, to break this down for you again, and we go down here to our first detection here. I'll look, I'll use the right walk right one. This is a good one, of course. Okay, so it's reading in the, oh, I see, it's reading it in the move player left routine. So this is where it's controlling that call from. So right here, it's checking to see is it equal to zero. And if it's equal to zero, then it's going to go to the scroll. That means basically there's nothing there and we can scroll the screen in that direction. Otherwise, we're going to block the screen there. That's initially how that works. And rather than return the code, we could end up blocking it. But somewhere down here, there should be another LDL1 right here. If, I know if we set this to zero, the pilot is passed to the left anyway, because now we have no blocking going on. So that one should work. I probably would have had to change a few different code examples for that to work properly. But hopefully you get the, the gist of this. Let's try it again. And there it is. See how I'm able to pass through now. Now I'm going to move to the right because the right is still blocked, but I can move to the left. So essentially he's just going to go off the screen there and do some funky things. But hopefully that part makes sense for you. And let's go back and restore this. Um, not necessary to really change it. I just wanted to demonstrate if you didn't understand collisions, that's how they're taking place in this project. They're just reading those ones and those zeros into those areas there. This is the, the fetch play field. I did talk about this in the initial video here too. So this is being read from the screen memory routine, I believe it is. Yeah, it's right here. Fetch play field line address. So what this is doing, let's switch this over here. I'm going to put these two side by side so we can see them. So right here, after we read in all the deltas and go past all these checks or whatever, we read in pram2, which this is checking the Y position because this one is moving to the right, but it's checking it on the Y to see what data exists at that sprite position. And it's going to fetch the play field line address, of course, and we, of course, go back to sprite routine. I'm sorry, that's where it's uh, screen memory. I'll put that over there. It's going to take the screen data, which is down here. This is screen two. It's detecting, is it screen two or screen one? And that's the, the, hot, the buffer that's flipping back and forth between the screens to prevent the um, screen from tearing and stuff like that and the scrolling to be smooth. And it's right here. It's it's reading. I'm in the wrong place here. Excuse me. Right here. It's reading in screen one line asset or screen two would be further down. And all it's doing is it's reading screen memory positions as we move across those areas. And if you go back up here, that's exactly what it's doing. And remember, it's storing it back into our zero page pointers one and the low and the high byte. Now these are used quite frequently throughout the project, of course, but getting back to this one, now that we have that in zero page pointer, you can see right down here, it's now checking, it's loading in the data that we just passed in from there, which we know is our screen, that's the screen character, right? And then now it knows the screen character here, and look, lo and behold, we're going to our test blocking, right? Now keep in mind, zero page pointer still has that screen data in it, so it's checking 
going back here to Vice Simulator. And actually, let me just rerun that here for a minute. What we're doing here is we're checking these screen locations, right? And I think our um, left is back on. Yeah, it's back on, so we can't move to the left anymore there, nor can we move to the wall. But it's checking each individual screen area here. So if you look here, it's actually checking to see what is on the screen here. There's a ladder here, right? We're on a ladder. Over here, there's some kind of um, open area. And then, of course, there's a wall to the left here as so we're moving to the left here. So going back to our CBM PRG Studio and back to our collision detection, we know that that zero-page pointer is detecting that tile or that character data that's on the screen there. And it's going to now jump to this subroutine of test blocking. And if we go down to test blocking further down here, we see it stores that screen data into the collider ATTR. This is the collider attribute. So basically, it's just a collision for an attribute on the screen. So keep in track of the screen info on the screen there. Um, and right down here, it's going to load the X register starting with that area. And it's going to pass an attribute data mem. Now, if you remember from, as I mentioned in the other video, from video three, we talked about the attribute data that can be written into Charpad to detect if you're bumping into a wall, if you're bumping into a ladder, just by switching it out. So you could have ones to represent a wall, or you could have twos to represent a ladder or a, a pole in the original example I had. And then from there, now we're going to basically mask out this color data so we can only get those attributes. And then we, we store that. And then we're just basically checking it to say, is this value equal? Did we find something here? And if it's equal to zero, we didn't find anything. We just return back here. And um, essentially here, we're checking here for a ladder, right? So now we know inside this collider data, or, I'm sorry, this attribute area here, it already found that screen mem because it reads the attribute memory area from our attribute data, which is down here, which is reading directly from the attribute that we saved from Charpad. And that's what it's doing is it's capturing that data into that area. Um, get back to our collision here. And it's able to detect these collisions on the screen. So later you can have something like LDA, Collider, ATTR, compare it to see is there a ladder there. And up above here, I think I have the data here somewhere. Right area. Oh, right here, this Collider ladder. I'm only checking the ladder for this one. So the ladder is going to be 30. And that's checking that attribute memory data to say there's a ladder there because our original charpad example told us there was a ladder there. So now you can see my charpad data is loaded in here and I could turn on the attribute data, which is essentially using this little glasses one right there, looks like that. And you'll see the ones represent the attribute of one, but if we scroll down here, it should change down here. You'll see there's a three actually for the ladder there. And that's exactly what that was doing back here in this area for the CBM PRG studio here is it's reading in this attribute data here to see what is being found there in that collision. And then this is just detecting right here, it's a three, three zero is actually the three because it's masking out that other data to get the three. So hopefully that makes sense there. There's a lot of fun things you can do and we'll do so much more with this project as we continue to move forward with it. I just wanted to kind of um, show you there's so much you can really learn about you know, game design in general is really understanding how screen memory interacts with your characters, your sprites, and just everything that's going on in your world there. So this is only one simple, simplified example of showing you how collision data works so that we can get those collisions going on. But later, uh, we'll be doing so much more um, beyond this. You're going to see eventually, um, once we're past the animation states and some other stuff, you're going to actually see other sprites on the screen. That's the goal here and we'll have collisions going against them. They'll have to check those guys for their attributes as they bump into screen data and stuff like that. And, you know, we'll be on our way to seeing a real-time gain there by that point. That's the vision here. So, yeah, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. And um, please, as always, like, subscribe. I appreciate your um, subscriptions and just look forward to just, you know, learning and just seeing whatever questions you have here and, yeah, I, I enjoy creating these kind of videos for you and just seeing what we can come up with. You know, for some reason I'm stuck here and I can't seem to move past this. But, <laughs> yeah. So, go ahead and leave me comments in the YouTube section and even on Facebook there. And then we'll go ahead and we'll I'll get back to you shortly there. And thanks for watching as always, guys. You guys have a wonderful day.
Hi everybody, this is Steve, and I hope you enjoyed the Commodore 64 game project code example. In this video, we actually covered learning how sprite animation works. So I showed you how the variables control the timing and the frames, and uh, the second byte in the variable controls the individual frames from the CBM PRG Studio sprite editor, and you can alter and change those, and it, it, it uses that uh, ping pong going back and forth where you can actually switch between one frame and the next frame and kind of just keep going, alternating back and forth between them. And also in this video, we covered how the collision detection works. So I showed you how when the sprite's bumping against a wall, we could actually clear that path and allow them to continue. So remember, as it's reading the screen memory address in that area, it detects that a collision has occurred because the screen memory is now aligning with the sprite's data. And as a result of that, the accumulator is going to return a 1 to let us know a collision occurred. And if there's, and that essentially blocks the sprite from moving left, right, up, or down in that direction because a wall exists in that direction. Basically, there's, there's a blocked path. Otherwise, the accumulator is going to just return to 0 and clear it because now we know screen memory is equal to 0 and there's no data found there. So the sprite can freely move left, right, up, or down because it hasn't bumped up against anything. And that can also be used to detect stuff like ladders, objects, and many other stuff as we get further into the development of this project. Yeah, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I always um, look forward to hearing your comments on YouTube and on Facebook, questions about your coding examples. Let me know how these are turning out for you. Are you guys working with any of the code examples? Is stuff still confusing to you? Because I really want to help you guys get on the same page. It's not easy creating videos like this because um, machine language or a semi language itself is an art in itself and it takes a little bit of time to learn especially for people trying to come in here if you don't have any programming background like a basic or even especially a semi language then you're going to be kind of stuck and dry trying to figure out how to put things together and this is not a full semi language video rather it's just taking a project and showing you how to break it apart and create something out of it maybe later we'll create more simplified examples but for right now this was a project handed down to me as i mentioned at one time in 2015 from the machine language project when we started this group on youtube and yes from there i was able to over time eventually learn how it all worked but it took me a, a good while to understand it and now i understand how to make a full scrolling game and yeah it's, it's just exciting and fun so i guys i always appreciate these subscriptions as i mentioned i can't say that enough ring the notification bell um Yes, and I appreciate everything you guys do support. Help me grow this channel, share the videos and everything. Um, and on, you know, the Facebook, please um, join me up and, yeah, add me as a friend and I'll add you back. And I look forward to hearing you guys um, feedback and everything. And you guys have a wonderful day.